sometimes we present these topics about the three angels' messages and go off and leave them, not realizing what we have said. And I think the time is coming when Seventh Adventists are unmindful of some of the things we've been saying for years and years and years, because sometimes we're denying what we said in the past. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation 13, verse 14. Revelation 13, 14. I want you to notice who it is that uh, decides to form an image to the beast, for sometimes we misunderstand this. It's talking about the lamb-like beast, as you well know, the second beast of Revelation 13. And deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Who is the one who says these words? The lamb-like beast. The lamb-like beast says this. Isn't that true? And the lamb-like beast is Protestant United States. Not Catholic United States, Protestant United States says this. And the spirit of prophecy emphasizes this repeatedly in many, many places and ways. That is, Protestants who say we should form an image to the beast. In Great Controversy, page 445, I read, The image of the beast represents that form of, of apostate Protestantism. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism. Now, what is it? Protestantism. May I ask you again, what is it? Protestantism. It represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Now, it's time we let that sink inside of our heads. All of us. Not too many of us really believe this. We've read it. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We're convinced that what it says is true. But the comprehension of this and all that it infers and implies is not always accepted by us. There are facts of it are accepted, so don't misunderstand me. But all that's inferred and implied is not always accepted by us, at least not by everyone. And so we develop this form of apostate Protestantism as they try to enforce their dogmas by the use of civil power. Now, it's not Catholicism, as so many people have stated, that would cause this uh, image of the beast to be formed. Not at all. It's Protestantism, and we need to remember this very accurately. Back in the 1840s, the very early 1840s, when they first began to preach Babylon is fallen is fallen, the reference primarily at that time was to Protestantism in the early 1840s, not to Catholicism. And the spirit of prophecy makes this very plain in Great Controversy, page 383. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt. Since this message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Roman Church alone. Because of the time element, it cannot refer to the Roman Church alone. For that Church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. And she goes on to describe how it, this refers primarily to the Protestant churches. Now, we've come to have some ideas these days, you know, about Protestantism that are a little different. We have no right to be critical of another denomination. We have no right to act exclusive or pharisaical. We have no right to criticize people above all. But the Lord expects you to make a decision about these very widely differing doctrines and teachings. He expects you to do it. And you're Salvation or eternal loss will depend upon your decision. And it behooves you to very honestly and candidly look at the differences. For in spite of the ecumenical movement, there are still wide differences, contradictory differences. And you cannot kid yourself, even though you'd like to, that these differences are being uh, taken care of. They're not. They're just being bypassed and not even examined at all, assuming that they'll take care of themselves. And the Lord expects us to sit down and look at this. Now, how can Protestant churches, and I've been a member of a Protestant church, attended one, I was never a member actually, all my childhood, as have many of you, how can these churches get to the place where they will exact worship from people, demand it on a certain day, and ask the civil government to back them up in doing this? How can they degenerate to the place where they will do this? 
in the book Coming Crisis by L. F. M. Wilcox, pages 15 and 16, he quotes from Review and Herald articles, June 15, 1897. Speaking of this very situation, he said, The world has converted the church. The world has converted the church. This could be true of Adventists as well. Both, meaning the world and the church, are in harmony and are acting on a short-sighted policy. Both are in harmony. They're acting on a short-sighted policy. Later on, that same quotation says, The Protestant governments will reach a strange path. They will be converted to the world. They will also, in their separation from God, work to make falsehood and apostasy from God the law of the nation. They'll work to make falsehood and apostasy from God the law of the nation. One more great controversy, page 383. But they, meaning Protestants, fell by the same desire which was the curse and ruin of Israel, the desire of imitating the practices and courting the friendship of the ungodly. How do they fall? Same way as Israel. The desire of imitating and the practices and courting the friendship of the ungodly. Now today, more and more Seventh-day Adventists are being converted to the world. Uh, you know, Seventh-day Adventists don't like you to say this. If you say this, you're critical of Adventists. Adventists are failing. If they're failing, God must not be with them. If God's not with them, they're going to be lost. We go through that rationality. We really do. And we get very bristly when you talk about Seventh-day Adventists. And the older you are in the message, the lot more bristly you get sometimes. But the spirit of prophecy in the Bible is very specific. We have much for which we can be criticized. And those who are not blind will accept the criticism. And those who are bigoted and prejudiced and exclusive will not accept it. And I mean all those words very honestly and forthrightly. If you can't accept there's something wrong with you. If I can't accept there's something wrong with me. And I think I'm just as loyal as you are. Blindness does not prove your loyalty at all. Not a bit. It only proves your ignorance. Isn't that true? Blindness doesn't make me loyal. The, the intent to obscure the failures of my church or myself doesn't make me loyal. Nor does it make me a child of God. It just means I have so many hang-ups, I'm overly protective, and I cannot face the truth about myself or my home or my church. And I cannot afford to be blind and be lost. Nor can you. And I'm very mindful that in Loma Linda, if you say anything about our failures, you're a terrible person. You are. You must not say that. It might be ever so true, but don't ever say it. Don't ever say it. And the person who says it must have something wrong with him because pretty soon he loses his paycheck. He doesn't have good sense. This is true, isn't it? And I've never seen such frightened people as I've seen here. And that's the truth. I've never seen such frightened people as I've seen here. Many people's lips are sealed from saying what their heart tells them, what the Bible tells them, what the Spirit of Prophecy tells them, for fear of loss of a livelihood. And the Lord has promised us he would always take care of us if we seek him first. Isn't that true? And while professing to have no fear because our God will take care of us, we're frightened when it comes to loss of a job if we say something that might be the truth. I don't think we ought to be critical. I don't think we ought to be vengeful or have a nasty attitude toward people or institution at all. But I think the times are so desperate that while our children are going under, literally, while we have hundreds and literally thousands of members succumbing to the temptations of the devil and falling by the wayside, we still sit around saying, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Don't let my kids you. There's nothing wrong. We're doing fine. The Lord is with us. We're not failing. And this really bothers me very, very much. I hope it bothers you. I really do. Because if it doesn't bother you, then I'm really worried and bothered. It doesn't affect you. And the lukewarm condition, it seems to me, is one that seems to say, sleep on, everything is fine when your house is burning down. It seems that way to me. Don't get upset. Don't find any fault. Don't think anything is wrong. Don't rock the boat. Peace at all costs. Don't even get out the fire hose. Just let the house burn down. Let everyone be lost. But don't say anything. Don't say anything. Don't mention it. It might be dangerous. I really get upset about this. 
terribly upset. As one man said, uh, when asked what was wrong with our church in a large meeting, several people stood up to say, well, there's nothing wrong, we're doing everything fine. And this minister said, that's what we're paid to say. And he was an old timer too, that's what we're paid to say, everything is fine. Everything is fine when you're losing your children. And there's every evidence under the sun that they are going the wrong way, and it's most difficult to rescue them. If you can say that's fine, then something is wrong. If you open up your eyes and listen, and open up your ears and listen sometimes, you'll see so many things that say that everything is not well with Israel. Everything is not well. Tonight I want to look at others, and the reason I spent so much time on us is so you'll not think I have a distorted viewpoint, because we cannot afford to criticize others when we have so many troubles of our own. And the spirit of prophecy makes this quite evident in a quotation from uh, Review and Herald articles, March 8, 1923, and just skipping two sentences there. Let the church arise and repent of her backslidings before God. Then we have not the first reason for self-congratulation and self-exaltation. Not the first reason for this. Let the church arise and repent of her backslidings. Now, in the light of all of this, if the Protestant churches will be the leaders in establishing and inspiring Sunday laws, what is your attitude toward Protestant churches today? Today. I was in a meeting not long ago where a minister described a meeting of Adventist young people he attended within the last month, in which they expressed views toward Protestantism much different from his. Great affection for Protestant churches and belief, and great uh, friendship feeling that they had much to offer that we do not, that perhaps they were far in advance of us in many things, in spirituality and conversion, conversion and in uh, knowing Christ. And he said, in the light of this, how should we be teaching our young people today with this, this attitude? If you have not heard it yet, you should be aware that there are some who are now dabbling in tongues among the Seventh-day Adventist church, church membership. Adults and young people. It has hit almost every other denomination, even the Catholics. As you know, at Notre Dame University, there are quite a large group been speaking tongues for several years now. And uh, I don't know of any denomination harder that has not been hit by the glossolalia movement, and it is now making inroads in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And there are some who think that this is very permissible, perhaps even recommended, and perhaps even blessed of the Lord. Now, I've been acquainted with some time for those who have uh, visited other churches and been intrigued by their zeal and their Christian experience, even envied them. And many Adventists have felt that we are too sedate, too lethargic, too irresponsive. Just sit there, immovable, never say amen, never say alleluia as they once did in Mrs. White's time. Uh, nothing like this at all. In fact, many pastors express their, how they're irked by this. I'm one of them. One man talks about the pew-paralyzed, sermon-saturated Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> and if you don't think this is true, stand up here for a few months and let me know your response, your reaction. And I'm delighted when people disagree with me at the door. Just plain delighted. If you disagree with me, at least shows that something happened that day that I didn't miss your ears nor your mind. And disagree with me all you wish, but do something. That's all I care. Just do something. And that flattery is not needed at all, not in the slightest. But it's stimulating to know that someone listened and didn't like what you said, or didn't agree with what you said, or thought you were way off in left field or right field or some other field. It's nice to know, you know, that something has been being heard and some response is coming back. Now, the old-fashioned believers responded immediately. If they believed it and they liked it, they let you know by saying amen. And it wasn't embarrassing to say it. When I hear it nowadays, it's almost always at the wrong place. <laughs> and uh, you wonder if they even heard what you said. They say amen to the wrong thing sometimes. And the rest of the time, when they should say amen, you hear almost nothing. And I'm ask, not asking for excited, jumping up and down type of church. I don't believe in that, as you, I think you know by now. But responsiveness, re the recognition of God speaking to us, that the Lord is present here. 
and that we're delighted that he would stoop to speak to us and rejoice because he offers us so much. The response to his presence and to his voice is literally demanded, is it not? Because he is God and we're just mere human beings. Do we recognize that uh, when he speaks it's a wonderful privilege, is it not? And how we should respond. Now I'd like to just jump into this a little bit if you do not mind. Often people point to the thrilling converting experiences of those in other denominations. I wish to speak about one group, not because I'm critical, but because I understand them very well, I believe. Uh, the Baptists, especially Southern Baptists. I've been very much acquainted with some of these folk who had a very out, a most outstanding experience. And from every appearance, seemed to be genuinely converted and rejoicing in the Lord and seemed to have more to offer or to testify to an experience, a converting experience than often we do. For sometimes ours seems so, uh, you know, quiet and uh, no life and no enthusiasm and as though nothing happened to us. And those seem to be just bubbling over. As we're going to Africa on a ship, 26 days on the ship, that's a tour, <laughs> really a full boat to China, although it's to Africa, there was a young lady on board the ship that was going out to Zululand to be a missionary, a very zealous young person from Los Angeles, a recent convert, by that I mean three years prior to that time. She loved to tell about her experience with the Lord. And I knew she was a Baptist, and she was uh, very outspoken about this, and I appreciated it greatly. And I decided I would visit with her and ask her why she had such a good experience, and on what she based her converting experience in this still fresh new first love that she seemed to just exude every time you met her. And so one day in a storm, we were out there on the deck of the ship, hiding behind the protection there, we were visiting, and I was quizzing her about her experience, and she was a minister. So we talked back and forth and back and forth about this. The thing that thrilled her the most, that turned her out, as young people say nowadays, was the fact that she was guaranteed, without fail, eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. You may laugh, but it's not funny to them. It's exceedingly exciting, very exciting. It's what some have termed eternal security, or not predestination at all, not that. Eternal security, or once saved, always saved, as Seventh-day Adventists usually call it. And I visited with her about this and to discuss with her and determine uh, what she really meant by this and what it meant to her, why this was such a wonderful thing to her. She just said to me, well, I'm just, no, I have a place in the kingdom. I'm assured of it. I can't fail. I can't miss it. Already mine. No doubt. It's already mine. And I would not have you to believe that there's no certainties in the Christian religion. And I'll speak about the certainty someday. There's much room for certainty for what God has promised he's able to perform. But there's still a human element involved, is there not? And there's still some ifs. And so I visited back and forth about this eternal security, and it seemed to me that all her joy, all her happiness, uh, all her hope, and even her conversion was based on what she supposed is a guarantee of eternal life without fail in the kingdom of heaven. On that one premise of eternal security, I have talked to many, many others before and since who assured me this was their hope and their one assurance. Now, the reason why they believe this way is that they believe themselves to be converted, born of the Spirit, and therefore they have become a child of God. If you're a child of God, you're an heir of the kingdom, are you not? And of the life that's found in Christ. So if you're now a child of God and an heir, then what? Will you not get the inheritance because you're a child? And so the logic tells you yes. And if you're a child, you cannot lose the inheritance because you're a child, it's yours. You can be assured of it. And as one old, old Baptist asked me one time, a very fine Christian gentleman, he said, uh, Elder Layman, how can you be unborn? And by this he was saying, if you cannot be unborn, you're always a child of God, and therefore you have certainty that you will have eternal life in the kingdom. There's no doubt about it. You cannot be unborn. I can remember the first time I was hit with this, and if you have not been hit with it yet, you better memorize every word I'm saying, because let me tell you, it can really upset you terribly if you haven't understood this before. How can you be unborn? And I've been pushed 
by people like this. Please tell me about this. The idea is that friendship entitles you to the birthright, as the Bible calls it, the inheritance that the Father will bequeath to you, or has bequeathed to us, you see. If I'm a child, it's automatically mine, because I'm his son. Therefore, it's a guarantee, and I can have great assurance of it. And many thousands believe this, and there's danger that some of us get into this area. Maybe it's a little cloudy to us and not as definite as it is to them. But I know an Adventist minister who went off to the Baptist to get converted. And I know writing one book of ours that tells about several who've done this among Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, going out there to hear about Christ and be converted and come back to hear the doctrine of truth from the Seventh-day Adventists. Because we do not preach Christ, but we only preach doctrine. And the criticism is often too true. It doesn't have to always be true, but sometimes it is. Now, the Bible tells about a son who did not receive his birthright. Doesn't it? The Bible tells of a son who was still a son, but not, did not get his birthright. And it's quoted in both the Old and New Testament. And we need to go back and study sonship because sometimes we assume that we are children of God, you see, and therefore entitled to the birthright and come to us without fail. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 16 and 17, it tells you about this person who was a son and yet did not receive his birthright. 16 and 17. At least not the one he expected. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You can lose it. You don't just lose it inadvertently. You get rid of it with premeditated and now it's a forethought. It just doesn't slip away. It doesn't elusive that way. He sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. When you go back to Genesis chapter 25 and verse 34, you'll find out why he sold it. 25 verse 34. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The reason he sold it is it wasn't very valuable to him. Traded it for a mess of lentils. Just one pot of food was more precious in his sight at that moment than anything the birthright had to offer. You cannot be unborn if you're a child of God, but you can surely despise the blessings of sonship to God. And when you despise it and it's no longer precious to you, it is no longer bequeathed to you because you cannot appreciate it any longer. Heaven and eternal life will be given to all of those who so supremely appreciate it, they'll forsake everything else to have it. You know the parables, how the man found the treasure in the field, and he sold everything he had to come into possession of the treasure. And what if on the pearl of great price, he sold everything he had to get that one pearl. And so those who genuinely appreciate the kingdom of the kingdom and put it first in their experience in their life, nothing else is meaningful to them except that one thing. They'll forsake and forget everything to have that, and it matters not what it is. They only want that one thing. Heaven is given as a birthright to those who supremely appreciate it. But if we despise it, or minimize it, or neglect it to show our attitude toward it, then of course you see, it now it slips away, we just let other things take our affections and choose not to be interested in that place. And these days, when we expect to go to the kingdom very, very soon, it's so easy to despise the birthright. In this materialistic society, literally we're saying, I like this place, I like what I have, and I want to keep it. Aren't we? I want to keep it. Don't take it away. I need it. Let me have it. She pleases me well, Samson's idea. Pleases me well. It just pleases me well. Let me keep it. Why can't I have it? What's wrong with it? Are our question. And we want to hang on to it. Now, many are deceived regarding conversion and friendship to God. You see, we assume sometimes that because we finally find hope in some wonderful news, and by the way, if eternal security were true, it would be glorious news, would it not? Certainly. If it's true, it's glorious news. If I have a guarantee that I can never be lost, that's tremendous, you see. Never be lost, it's already mine. 
I recognize how presumptuous it is, but nevertheless, uh, it is glorious news. And so they assume because it's good news, it must be the gospel. And of course, when you latch on to some new affection like this, you do forsake a lot of other things to have it. And therefore, it's easy to assume we have a converting experience because we found new hope in a wonderful new message, eternal security, and we say I'm, everything is all right. Is everything all right? And how do you find out? Now, the Bible tells us the test of sonship. And the test of sonship is not eternal security. And it's not because I found some wonderful new gospel that sounds good to me. It isn't based on that at all. The test of sonship in the Bible is very vividly described in a discussion and maybe an argument some would call that Jesus had with the Jews in John chapter 8. I'm going to start with verses 31 to 34. And I think in these days, we need to read some of these discussions Jesus had far more frequently than we do. For here is buried the truth that I think will clarify much of the confusion of our time. And this is one chapter that helps to clarify very, very much. Verses 31 to 34, first of all. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, obey it, in other words, then are ye my disciples indeed. By your doing what I have said, you establish that you are my disciple. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? They said, We're the children of Abraham. Since God made the contract or agreement with Abraham, we are guaranteed a home and a kingdom and eternal life. Isn't that right? God promised this to Abraham. We are his children. So the kingdom is ours. So the Jews believed in eternal security if they were born as the descendant of Abraham. And so he said, Why do you say the truth shall make us free? We've never been in slavery. We're Abraham's seed. We're free. And the kingdom is automatically ours. Now verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I send to you, Whosoever commit a sin is the servant of sin. He's not free anymore. He goes on to this discussion about Abraham uh, there in that chapter in verse 37. I know that you're Abraham's seed, he said, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. You profess to be Abraham's offspring, and you are physically his descendant, but he said, you're trying to kill me. Now verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And killing him, by the way, was not the works of Abraham, as he brings up in the next verse. But now, he said, ye seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the same kind of works as he did. Now you're trying to kill me. Abraham never did this. Not at all. Therefore, you're not what? The children of Abraham. And even though you're born one of his lineal descendants, still you're not his children. Because his children are the kind that do the same works as he did. They're like him in their works. Then verses 42 and 44. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. In verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer, not Abraham, not the father, God the father, but the devil, he said. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in, in him. When he speak of a lie, he speak of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So he said, you profess to be the children of Abraham, and therefore guarantee a place in the kingdom. But you do not the works of Abraham. Abraham never tried to kill me, and he would never try to kill the Son of God, the one whom he loves so much. But now you seek to kill me. You're not children of God, as you've assumed. You're children of the devil. Wasn't he very diplomatic? He was really a smooth preacher, wasn't he? I do not recommend you use this always. There might be a rare occasion when it can be used, but it surely is not his regular procedure. Sir Prophet makes it plain, whenever he rebuked people, there were tears in his voice. I'm not sure we say those words that way. Tears in his voice because he died for all souls, did he not? Because he loved them so supremely. This is a most unusual thing, you know. We can assume that we're children of God because of a certain experience we think we have had. 
and therefore assume that we are guaranteed a place in the kingdom. And the Laodicean message tells about a people who believe they have a right to the kingdom. Isn't that true? Who will say they're rich and increase their goods and have need of nothing. They have a right to the kingdom. And will be so deceived they'll not realize that they're blind and dumb and naked and that he's outside trying to get inside. Self-deceived. It seems almost impossible people are like that. But the spirit of prophecy makes it very plain in the early chapters of great controversy that the Jews are so totally deceived that after they had killed Christ, they still believed that they were children of God and would inherit the kingdom. And when the Roman army came down to besiege Jerusalem in 70 AD, they ran the temple believing that God was still going to save them. Even then. Even then. After all they had done wrong, and the distance they had gone away from the Lord, they could still assume that they were children of God were going to make it. And we assume the same thing sometimes. In Deuteronomy ages, page 466 and 7, it talks about this Abraham seed idea. The Pharisees had declared themselves the children of Abraham. Jesus told them that this claim would be established only by doing the works of Abraham. The true, true children of Abraham would live as he did, a life of obedience to God. They would not try to kill one who was speaking the truth that was given him from God. In plotting against Christ, the rabbis were not doing the works of Abraham. A mere lineal descent from Abraham was of no value without a spiritual connection with him, which would be manifested in possessing the same spirit and doing the same works they were not his children. Descent from Abraham was proved not by name and lineage, but by likeness of character. Now, I'm not just thinking about those in other denominations. I'm thinking about you and me. Are we children of God? And do we have an inheritance? And this is, this, is this established by our likeness to God. It's established by that. As I look at other people, we see it so glaringly in them, but we do not see it so well in ourselves. The character of God is written down in something we call the Ten Commandments. For we understand this to be a description of what God is truly like. What do I think of his law? What do I think of his law? If the character of God is to be reproduced in us, in us his children, if his character is written down as his law, what do I think about his character in the law? What do those of other denominations think about his character written in the law? And this is not just a matter of whether I keep the Sabbath and they don't. This is a matter of what think you of Christ and what think you of God. This is what it is. I profess to be his child, but I can't recognize his character when I see it written down. And I even say it's destroyed, and I call that old yoke of bondage. Uh, there are some of our offspring today who call it that old law, too. And they grew up in our churches, under our ministry, under our tutelage, in our Sabbath school classes, and in our home. Didn't they? And they don't like the Bible, the Word of God. And the worst class they now have in school is a Bible class. And they say it very loud and strong in many, many, many Seventh-day Adventist schools, if not all of them. Some of the most unpopular classes we have are the Bible classes today. And I know there are various reasons for this. But why is it that our children do not receive a love of the Bible, the Word of God, and the character of God, and the law of God in our homes, in our churches, in our Sabbath schools? Why didn't they? What did we do wrong? And as I look at others, I wonder if we ourselves are not making the same mistake as others are. And the Bible tells how these people will go out and form laws that will coerce their neighbors and their brethren into worshiping like somebody else wants you to, not like your conscience tells you to. There's another thing about this. James chapter 4, verse 4. If really I'm in love with the kingdom of God, and if really I've been converted and I'm a child of God and belong to his family, then what do I think about this text? The adulterers and adulteresses 
Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What is my attitude toward God's enemy? If I'm his child, if I'm a citizen of his kingdom, what is my attitude? What is the attitude of those who claim they've been converted in other churches? And the Spirit of Prophecy said they're being converted to the world. What is the attitude of, of us who can't see anything wrong with hobnobbing with the world, following its fashion, its dress, its entertainment? Should I say some more? Its interests, its desires, its philosophy, its plans, its education? Designs for institutions. You just go on and on. We've done an awful lot, friends. That is friendship with the world. Identifying, identifying ourselves with them, desiring those things that please them, and even trying to please them ourselves. Seeking those things that receive the approbation of the world, not of God. And copying those ways and not his ways. We've done a tremendous amount that way. And today we come to the place where if it's logical, it's acceptable. And it matters not whether the Lord says, thou shalt not or thou shalt. If it's logical, it's all right. We do not wait on the thus day of the Lord. We do not need that. If it makes good sense, that's fine. And we assume that this is God's way because it's logical. And I wonder, really, if we stop to realize that we're too friendly with God's enemy sometimes and all the time claiming to be God's friend and God's son. I wish we had time to discuss some other temptations and denominations that are wooing us. We'll do this another time. What I'm trying to say here is the spirit prophecy, and the Bible makes it plain, that apostate Protestantism are the ones who will make it most severe on Seventh-day Adventists. Most severe. Until we become the off-scouring of the earth are the words the spirit prophecy uses. They're the ones who will coerce, and even persecute us. If you do not believe us, go to Houston, Texas, and ask them who it was in 1962 try to make a city business Sunday law. What denomination? And almost every person in the city who lived there can tell you. And it became very obvious that in less than a year after the Supreme Court made their decision that certain groups of Protestants made it very, very severe on Seventh-day Adventists or attempted to. If this is not sufficient warning to you, just wait a little while, there'll be many more. Our interest in other denominations, assuming that they have something that we don't have, that they have a zeal, a converting experience, a spirit of God, or whatever you wish to call it, that we lack, and that we can find it over there, is a denial of the three angels' messages. A total denial. And it means that we are so blind that we do not understand what the things of messages teach. And we do not apply them to our experience. Now, I know that some of you are saying here, Elder Layman, you're so outspoken. Then when you tear these pages out of your Bible, what age are you living in? The Middle Ages or the last days? When is your Christ coming? A thousand years from now or very, very soon? When will these messages apply if they've been preached now for 130 years? When will they apply? When will these things be true? Has our denomination been wrong for all these years, all these decades, in announcing that these things apply to this era of time? Have we been wrong? Has God misled us, or have we just made mistakes? If these things are true, do they apply to people today? If they apply to us and to our children, how long are we going to bite our tongues and hide our heads in the sand and say, I hope this is not all true? How long? And how long are we going to talk about the ascetic things, the sophisticated, the intellectual, and obscure the thing which is the last message that God has for a dying world? How long? And the thing that upsets me the most is how can we be so comfortable and bite our tongues so long and hide our head in the sand so long when our very own children and loved ones are perishing outside of the Lord. How can we do this? We are deceiving ourselves in assuming that everything is all right when there is flagrant evidence that everything is all wrong, literally. It's all wrong. 
And I'm not critical of anybody or anything. I'm just saying it's time for things to change. Aren't you? It's time for things to change. I believe that we've done a good work in the past. I'm not critical of anything that's been done at all. But I believe that before Jesus can come, there must be some radical changes. I believe the day must come when our children just love Bible class. Every one of them almost in school. And when that's the one thing that's emphasized above everything else because it prepares people for the kingdom. And science and music and P and everything else takes the back seat to God in the Bible, not the front seat. And don't go look at the budgets in our schools and see how much is spent for Bible as compared to the other departments. You'll be shocked. And it's been true for decades and decades. And we have literally said by our performance that this is not important to us. Now, friends, we are saying it every day here, every Sabbath. If it's more alluring to go out to the desert on Sabbath or the mountains or the beach and skip church, then God and the church doesn't mean that much to you and it will not mean any more than that to your children. I found nothing wrong with having some time away from work. Don't misunderstand me. But there's such a frequency nowadays, you know, that our children think it's a good thing to get away from church, isn't it? Isn't it? It's a good thing to get away. And by the way, if your business, even though it be medic medicine, attracts you from home and from church every Sabbath, and I don't care how important it is, your children think that business is more important than Sabbath too. And they do. They do. And the same thing in my ministry. Whatever it be that lures us away from God and the preciousness of this message and the Sabbath and everything about this message and the Lord, if it lures us away from this and something else seems more valuable to us and more precious by our daily performance and activity, our children will act just as we act. And we're seeing this today. I can see nothing offered on the other side of the fence that I once left, that I want to go back to. And I'm not critical. And I do not feel a holier than thou attitude at all. I don't have this. I don't feel more exclusive because I don't think we have one right to pat ourselves on the back. I think all we need is great humility. And I see nothing over there to allure them. And the thing that bothers me so much is why will we not take time on our knees until the Lord is so precious to us that our own hearts just bubble with excitement and enthusiasm and glow with the warmth of the presence of the Spirit of God. Until everything about this message is so glorious to us, you know, that our every word literally just brings up the blessings of Christ and praise of Him. Until all our activities are praise for God. Until our young people and all our children all our neighbors can see that truly we have been with Jesus. And they will not be attracted elsewhere, for they'll see so much here to allure them, they would never think of going any other place. And the Lord is counting on Seventh-day Adventists to be the people that will so lift up Christ in the last days that all will be drawn unto him. Not all will come, but all will be drawn, will they not? And he's counting us so living the character of Christ before the world and esteeming the kingdom of heaven so precious to us that nothing else counts. And every day of my life, I demonstrate this. It's what he wants to see in us. Is that not true? Every day of our lives. I long for the day when a center like we have here, so blessed of God, so many sent here chosen of God, so many sent around the world to bring the glorious news by medical evangelism, so many that it again becomes a hub of influence, of spiritual influence, so mighty, that Christ is exalted, and literally thousands and millions are attracted to him because of our affection for Jesus and our likeness to him. For when he comes, the Bible says, we shall be like him. May God forbid that we lose the wonderful things he's given to us 